you look up. Okay. So this will be a short, uh, short book review. It's, it's more of a, I'll tell you why. Uh, so just quick introduction about the author. Uh, you all know Harari. Uh, his most famous book was on sapiens. Um, he is a professor in the Department of History at, uh, he's an Israeli scientist, professor in the Department <coughs> of uh, History at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. His famous book, first book was on sapiens. So sapiens, basically, it, the book was about the past. And his new book, which is in 2015, Homo Deus, it talks about the future. So all these three words, by the way, they are all Latin words. So sapiens, it means wise, as in the wisdom which a human has. Homo, uh, it should be homo, actually. It means man. Uh, so in more relevant terms, it's more to do with human. And deus, uh, or deus, I guess that's how it's pronounced. It means God. Uh, so why God? That we'll talk in the uh, summary of this. So here is a quick and simple chapter-wise summary. Mm. So what the author is trying to say in this book, and I'll just give a quick summary of what the author has already talked about in his previous book. So this book can be looked at as a sequel of the uh, first book. So Sapiens, he talks a lot about the historic background in the you know, pre-modern era and uh, what happened, like all the old things, uh, but in this book, he talks about future. So like, reading it, I felt like it's more like a sci-fi book, um, more to his imagination, not anything in the real world as such. Um, so he starts with few problems humankind has faced and has done a lot in overcoming those problems with all the grit and determination and how those problems are no more present and how the humans keep on evolving. So it talks about some problems which were very prevalent in the historic times, like the world wars, the epidemics, the famines, uh, and these problems are no longer the problems which trouble the people of today's generation. So we don't have a shortage of food. Yes, there are countries or there are regions which starve even today, but it's not because of shortage of food per se, but it's more to do with the politics in those regions or some other factors, uh, but food is there. So famines is not a huge issue epidemics or even the pandemic, which we are still currently in, even though it was a huge, huge thing two years back, today we have evolved and I would put it that way. It's not a part of book. It's just my uh, take on this uh, chapter that we as humans with all the wisdom we have uh, and the consciousness, we keep on evolving and we tackle the problems which come our way. So that is some kind of intelligence uh, a human has and that is some we can call it call it as our superpower yes yes okay. is that uh an irrelevant that is how no it, it's not something to do with from the primitive age to human not not that evolve if you if you understand yeah. that yeah maybe. adapt okay okay So in the next chapter, he talks about how humans have better intelligence as compared to animals. And then uh, he says that humans have since become God. Uh, so this is a little funny, but yeah, he, he points or he refers to human beings as gods just because of the superior intelligence a human has over animals. And then given this intelligence a human possesses, they make decisions whether or which animals should live or should be killed. So for instance, animals which are food to humans, they are farm raised and other animals which are 
not as much of importance to uh, uh, humans they are killed so it's kind of a selfish way of uh, dealing with animals as if they have no uh, feelings or emotions as such and yeah yeah <laughs> but he talks just about animals and he has kept on talking about animals even in the uh, further chapters yeah just breathe air <laughs> and this has altered the distribution of animals and then he puts in the term climate change uh, so the pyramid where there are wild animals and other animals which help maintain the food chain that is disturbed uh, because of some biased raising of some breed of animals and then uh, you know killing some other uh, breeds and that is somehow leading to climate change he still hasn't gone into the future part of it so in the initial chapters is just building the background uh, which will help us to imagine how the future would be given what's happening uh, in the current situation so homo sapiens uh, again it's the humans the wise humans is the most powerful species in the world uh, it has more authority over animals and they even have a conscious mind so they can think better they can make better decisions and uh, it, this chapter mainly just goes on and on about having the intelligence and how we are more powerful given the fact that we can handle or you know use our intelligence in a way that these animals cannot so that's a major point of distinction between humans and other animals even they have like eyes nose ears brain everything but still they don't have that kind of intelligence um then he, in this chapter he specifically picks this example where he says that the animals live in a dual reality whereas sapiens again sapiens means humans they live in a triple uh, reality so what this example he is trying to uh, say is um so let's say animals can see the background or you know the environment in which there are trees rivers and rocks okay so can humans but then humans have more information regarding money uh, there are some other terms which i did not uh, put in in this uh, sentence but money corporations nations democracy and uh, so on so that let's say animal has a tribe or a you know uh, herd or they have their own you know lion is this kind of one is called tribe right. and yeah right i mean that's equivalent of having a corporation or or some organization so it's not that you know uh, I, i don't think that but they it, have just a single single no no see see corporation is a sense of belonging national is a sense of you know having sense of belonging or tribe is a sense of belonging so there is some for my it's beyond uh, you know the uh, you know first part which is a physical thing feel you were off there is other thing and they know that it's not like they don't know that. even uh, people are with the plants have uh, emotions they talk to each other through you know roots that, that's you know extensive work in that area in national geographics in nature maybe you know all that so uh, that uh so i would argue here saying that even though they do have let's say the tribe kind of uh, let's just call it mentality for now uh, but still they are not using the way humans use intelligence to you know make things better or to make some advancements or so like that i think they you know pick and choose their sites to you know forage or you know select places that are safe to uh, hide i think the money thing yeah is a very different kind of thing because yeah. that is a representation and and reasoning about representation but, but the money thing. is uh, you know material bartering or exchange uh, you know kind of you can store the money and then use it for some other thing yeah. like that. well then the animals may have uh, you know the, the 
and the squirrel or chipmunk in <coughs> uh, you know this not so big, uh, and who knows they may be sharing uh, you know if, uh, one of the members is uh, starving maybe they are giving them yeah maybe but will will he change take the acorns in exchange for i don't know what health not care <laughs> or or well, rights or whatever. Not, that, not, that, not that extensive, right. per se. Yeah. But if all of this is uh, for humans, it is driven based on emotions and uh, things like that. Yeah. But for I mean, how do you know animals don't have emotions? Yeah. Yeah. They have but they, they do. do more of survival instincts and. Uh, like, no, wait, wait, wait. wait. That's no, 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 no. your interpretation of human yes. capability is exaggerated. I think that we're getting into sort of Dennett intentional stance territory here where we because we're sentient are thinking about this in terms of glorified capabilities that we are imposing on our own behavior and it might just be the same fundamental capability in all of us and yeah, i always yes. wonder like we as human beings have declared ourselves as the superior ones yeah. the intelligent ones what if the other animals out there are yeah i don't know i mean look at I, I, I think the COVID virus is pretty darn smart. It's a pretty yeah. good job yeah. with not very much brains, right? And, you know, insects also are very, very capable of completely undermining our, our civilization that's a very valid point and they there are some contradictory arguments in this book itself where they say that it's just not human brain but even a tiny cellular organism has equal capability as compared to a human just one addition numbers number if you know that yeah you have mentioned that is a maximum number of relationships human brain can handle but uh, number also shows this number actually is, is actually proportional to the number of cortex size so same part we can have different things and so on. So this group size actually depends on your size of your head. There's a correlation. I don't, I don't know this number. Dunbar number. It's very good. Yeah, spell it. Oh, Dunbar. Oh, Dunbar. Okay. Okay. So yes. So Vipuna, the, all these uh, extraordinary claims that he's making, <laughs> and does he uh, just put them out, or is it, does he explain why he thinks? Because when he says. Humans decide who lives and dies, right? Humans have been around for two million years. Whales, fish have been around for billions of years. Insects have been around for billions of years. So humans don't decide anything. In the, yeah, from an evolutionary standpoint, humans have not really survived that long to judge that they're superior to any other species. So, uh, so the yeah so the reason i say that this book is more like a sci-fi because it does not have a very strong grounding to justify why he's making all these claims in this book he's an anthropologist well, right? historian yeah yeah, and, yeah. And, you know very good writer but uh, and a storyteller but not very scientifically sound person so kaushik yeah it's more in the air building castles Yeah, then uh, this book is not just okay. So, um, I mean, think most of the books presented so far in this class are more to do with AI per se, but then this book has a very different take. It's not just artificial intelligence, but then more about the future overall. So, it talks about AI, it talks about genetic engineering, cyborg, creating superhumans, and more into the sci-fi fantasy world. Um, so this chapter talks about how it's different from pre-modern world and how the modern world has many technological uh, advancements. But then at the same time, we just don't blindly do what we feel like doing. There are uh, like the decisions human makes are still, uh, are still like they are, adhered to the moral belief so there is some some kind
Thank you. The next chapter is the continuation of the previous chapter. It talks further about modernity and how the life experiences of different people uh, shape their perspective uh, and even the decision-making process. So just one quick example is how these three people from different professions are unlikely to agree and they do not, not do not is very, is very strong uh, uh, word, but may not uh, agree on common points. Did Different good? Time, time. Yeah. Different words. Then uh, the author, for some reason, he even talks about religion and God and some something to do with the cosmic power, and says that humans have more power. And unlike the previous times where people used to think that there is some higher force driving their decisions and then he has given some examples um, as to building some churches or some cathedrals and so on and how those decisions were more uh, led by you know, some religious uh, views and how today's humans again given their intelligence they don't have to rely on the great cosmic plans and then there is one example where he talks about, uh, he gives a comparison between Syria and Netherlands, where he says that it's an atheist society, but it's far more peaceful as compared to God-fearing Syria. Then he talks about free will, uh, liberal uh, rights of humans, free market and democracy. And then for some reason, even this is part of this book, and the way he ties it uh, with the previous chapters is he states the pros and cons of free will and then how it being a pro, uh, like the positive thing is uh, humans can make, each human has their own thoughts, like individual thoughts, individual decision-making processes and how with free will this can lead to better development overall. At the same time, the con, he has given an example of a person who murders someone and then uh, it's like, the way he has put it is it should not be so such a uh, free will that you know you you can just simply go about doing anything. Again, this is one of the takes on the future, not not the current uh, scenario. Yeah. Then this chapter again goes back to the initial chapters where human beings, they hold a authority position in relation to animals and then how the technological developments are likely to make this belief obsolete. So what this basically means is, okay, so so far we have seen that, oh, humans are God, humans have super intelligence over other kinds of animals and they are at that top, uh, top uh, level of the animal, let's say, kingdom. Uh, but then with today's technological advancement, not just in AI, but even in other uh, streams of you know, bioengineering, bioscience, biochemical uh, uh, fields, there is a lot which will make humans obsolete. Uh, that is what this chapter is saying. And uh, humans are bound to lose two vital characteristics. One is intelligence, and then the second one is consciousness. And both go hand in hand. So, mm. he's saying that with the technology, people will lose intelligence? Yes, yes. So people, like humans, as he uh, refers to, they will heavily rely on the fancy, advanced, you know, 
fantasy kind futuristic technologies and that will deplete uh, the human intelligence because we won't think a lot we'll rely on machines to make decisions for us so humans will lose their intelligence humans will in addition to intelligence they'll also lose their consciousness to make better decisions yeah <laughs> Wall is an a uh, Pixar animated movie. Yeah, just just watch it. No thanks. <laughs> <laughs> then, as he has brought everything together in this book, he talks about religion, God, and uh, things like that. So he says that there will be a new religion. So he somehow points heavily towards Christianity and Islam. and then he says besides these two uh, in the world there will be new religions which will be based on purely on science and these religions will take birth in research labs uh, and then you'll get you know salvation through algorithms and genes <laughs> uh, yeah this is uh, like he i think he is just imagining and he seems like he has written this book in his you know fantasy world <laughs> Or maybe not. Yeah. Like, yeah. And then he even has named what that religion would be. It would be a techno religion, and then that can be divided into two categories: one where humans still have their say in it, and the other would be purely based on data. So instead of humanism, it would be called dataism. And the reason it's called dataism because it's going to uh, get all its decisions from the data, and it says that he defines dataism as the one where the universe is connected by the flow of data. Everything is connected to everything somehow. Like right from music to economics, using some some data patterns, which could be uh, very visible, or those could be latent, uh, and then creating a common language that is going to make sense of such data. So some examples would be uh, like even today we are using such kind of data, but in futuristic world, you could make extremely informed decisions using like the stock market data or electing the next president. so my critical view is it's just too futuristic too imaginary uh, like even if we have ai we have genetic engineering we have super humans using you know cyborg and those kind of things uh, don't think these things are likely to happen even in you know the next maybe 100 years so is it this book is is it like a sci-fi so there are some positives and negatives like people if you read on goodreads or any any portal uh, about the reviews it has a mixed set of reviews and even the author himself is quite criticized for his work because it's not solidly grounded yeah yeah <coughs> Or the earth is built on the foot of the turtle. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, like very classical kind of personal philosophy. But I like one of his quotes. I use in my you know Facebook talk whenever I write it. So in his uh, twenty lesson for the twentieth century, he wrote this line and just written it down. We have zero scientific evidence that he was tempted by serpents. <laughs> that soul of infidels burn in hell after they die. That the creator of universe doesn't lie. It when a branching marriage and festival. Yet billions of people have believed those stories for thousands of years. Some say it will last forever. This is fantastic. Nice. I, I like this part. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and that will predict our behavior. That function. Okay, guys. Uh, this wasn't all that. I think we, we, I wish we could have 